From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Tom Bates, Mr. Dollar. Tom... I'm acting county attorney since Dan Parker's death. Oh, yes. I was looking for you earlier. So Sheriff Peterson said. What was it you wanted to see me about? Didn't Peterson tell you why I'm in town? Yes, of course. You're an insurance investigator. You're here in connection with Parker's accident. Accident, did you say? I thought the sheriff straightened you out on that. He tried his best. Well, I'm afraid I can't tell you any Mr. more... Mr. Bates, than... are you in your office at the moment? Yes, I am. Stay there, then. I'll be right over. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Green Pass, Virginia, to the Home Office, Surety Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Qui Bono matter. Expense account continued. Item four, five cents, for a copy of the Green Pass Weekly Sentinel. I glanced through it as I walked across the square from the hotel of the courthouse. The big news, of course, was the tragic death of longtime county attorney Dan Parker. And two columns of the editorial page were devoted to eulogy and sympathy for the dead man's adopted daughter, Luann, who had mistaken her father for a prowler and shot him to death with his own gun. But neither the editorial nor the front page mentioned the fact that Luann, because of her mistake, stood to collect $100,000 worth of insurance. Come in. Are you Tom Bates? That's right. My name is Dollar. I just talked to you on the phone. And I told you I had nothing to say. Uh, mind if I sit down? Now, look here. You look, Mr. Bates. I've been in the business of insurance investigation for quite a while. And I probably know the legal rules and responsibilities of your office about as well as you do. Get out, Dollar. Well, for two cents, that's exactly what I'd do. And if I did, you'd find yourself in a real tight spot. What are you talking about? The company would have a battery of high-powered legal eagles in town by 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. And they'd have a subpoena, a restraining order, an order to show cause so quick it'd make your eyes bug out. And that's where it would start to get embarrassing, Mr. Bates. When you tried to explain to the court why you were withholding evidence and refusing to cooperate. What do you mean, refusing to cooperate? I haven't refused a thing. It sounded that way to me. I don't care how it sounded. I... Look, I know what you're up to. Peterson told me why you're here. Oh, you're out to muddy this thing up. You're trying to pin something on Miss Parker so you can get out of paying the insurance claim. And subpoena or no subpoena, you'll get no help from my office on a crooked deal like that. Any reason for you to think something could be pinned on her, Mr. Bates? Of course there's no reason. You saw the transcript of the coroner's inquiry, didn't you? I did. Well, did you find one single hint of suspicion anywhere in it? No, no. Not much of anything else for that matter. Are you always as gentle with your witnesses as you were with Miss Parker? The girl was half out of her mind with grief, on the verge of a breakdown. We got the facts. What more do you want? Maybe we should have thrown her in jail, beat her up with a rubber hose, starved her till she thought of something to confess. Is that the way you'd have done it? Oh, relax, Mr. Bates. You're not in a courtroom. No, and by heaven, I'm not going to be. Not on this case, because there's no reason. How long have you been in love with the Parker girl? Ever since I... What difference that make? It might help to account for your attitude about this. What is it you're thinking? That I'm helping her get away with something? Covering something up for her? Or that all of us are, maybe? Everybody at the inquest? <laughs> well, it wouldn't surprise me too much the way this whole town gets up on its high horse the minute you ask a simple question about the girl. Well, what do you expect when you go around insinuating... Insinuating she... nothing, Mr. Bates. I haven't accused Miss Parker of a thing. I have no reason to. And regardless of what you think or Sheriff Peterson thinks, I didn't come here to frame her, to pin something on her. I want just one thing. The complete, detailed story of Dan Parker's death. And I'm going to get it, one way or another. Well, nobody's trying to prevent you. I'm glad to hear it. Then how about some cooperation? What do you want to know? How long have you been Mr. Parker's assistant? Almost three years. And now you automatically become county attorney, is that it? Yes, until the next general election. Do you intend to run for the office at that time? Possibly. I don't see... How did you I... and Parker get along? Fine. Why? Well, did he approve of your interest in his daughter? 
Well, he certainly preferred me to... Well, anybody else in the run. Who else is in the running? Nobody, actually. Are you engaged to her? Not officially. She doesn't think she's quite ready to settle down. Uh Uh-huh. But if she had been ready, you... You think Mr. Parker would have welcomed you as a son-in-law, huh? I think so. I didn't kill him, Mr. Dollar. (laughs) Ever have any arguments with him? No. None of any importance. Who were his enemies, Mr. Bates? He didn't have any. A county attorney without a single enemy? That's a little remarkable, don't you think? That was the type of man he was. He'd usually let sleeping dogs lie. Easy going. Too much so, maybe. That was half the... Half the reason the two of you argued? Is that what you started to say? There were times when he should have gotten tough, or at least let me do it. Well, you'll have your chance now. And I'm going to take advantage of it. In one case, at least. Oh, what case is that? The Happy Hollow Roadhouse. That place should have been closed two years ago. But Mr. Parker wouldn't hear of it. And the sheriff wouldn't touch it without Parker's okay. Who runs it? A dirty little... His name's Sammy Drake. A cheap 30-cent crook. Why should the place be closed, Mr. Bates? Because it's a menace to the community. Drake's got everything going out there, wide open. He ought to be run out of town. And before the month's up, he will be. Was Drake a friend of Mr. Parker's? <laughs> Hardly. Is Miss Parker acquainted with him? She knows him, of course. In a town this small, everybody knows everybody else. Doesn't mean anything. I see. You see what? What are you driving at, anyway? The complete detailed story, that's all. Fine. But what bearing does this stuff have on the story? Oh, none, probably. The sheriff tells me Miss Parker is a dead shot with a pistol. Do you know if that's true? Yeah, absolutely. She can outshoot me any day of the week, along with most of the other men in the county. That's one of the tragic... One of the ironies of the thing. It was her own father who taught her to shoot. Was she given a paraffin test the night of the accident to determine whether she'd fired a gun? Of course not. In the first place, we're not set up for it. And in the second place, there was no doubt but what she had. The housekeeper heard the shots and ran out in the hall and saw her standing there with a gun in her hand. And she admits she fired him. What more do you want? I guess that ought to satisfy any reasonable person. Well, thanks a lot for your cooperation, Mr. Bates. You're welcome. And I'll frankly admit I don't have the slightest idea what line of thought it is you're trying to follow. It's the same one I've been following ever since I left Hartford. Do you know the Latin phrase, qui bono? Sure. Means who benefits. It was an old principle of Roman law. And it's still a good one. Who benefits here? Well, Luann Parker, of course, to the tune of $100,000. But maybe she's not the only one. There are different ways of benefiting, you know. It still comes back to the same thing. She's the one who mistook her father for a prowler that night. She's the one who pulled the trigger and fired the shots that killed him. Apparently so. But it's possible that somebody might have used her, Mr. Bates. Expense account item five, six dollars even. Flat rate payment to Jake Deagley for a couple of hours' use of his battered old taxi. I stopped at the telephone office and I talked with the supervisor. I talked with the editor of the local paper and with a waitress who'd gone to school with Luann Parker, with a boy in a service station who'd dated her in high school. And all of their remarks fit the same picture, a sweet, fresh, all-American girl with an adored father who'd showered her with gifts and attention. And now her own personal tragedy was the town's public one, and they all wept for her. Not a fact out of line. So finally I decided I'd filled in the background enough for the moment, and it was high time I met the little princess face to face. Yes, sir? Good afternoon. I'd like to see Miss Parker, please. Well, I'm sorry, sir, but she ain't here. Oh? She's been staying in with Dr. Praley and his wife. Seems like she just couldn't face this place after what happened here. Are you the housekeeper, Mary Jackson? That's right, sir. Well, I'd like to talk to you too, Mary, if you don't mind. What about, sir? Just a routine question or two. I'm with the insurance company that carries the policy on Mr. Parker's life. Well, I don't think I ought to go around talking Well, it's quite all right. Sheriff Peterson and Tom Bates are both cooperating with me, so you can be sure there's nothing wrong about it. Well, if them two say it's all right... They do. Then I reckon it is. Won't you come in, sir? 
In a few minutes' conversation, I learned that Mary Jackson had practically raised the Parker girl and worshipped both her and her father. She showed me the terrace where Dan Parker had bumped into the chair and wakened both his daughter and Mary, the back door where he'd entered the house that night, and then finally the main stairway where the shooting had taken place. When I heard the shots, all I could think was, oh, my poor baby, and I come running out in the hall. Hmm. Your room is the third door there, is that right? Yes, sir. Well, just then Miss Lou Ann turned on the lights, that switch right there beside you, and I saw her standing here at the top of the stairs with a gun in her hand. Then we both looked, saw it was Mr. Parker. We run down there. Miss Lou Ann tore off his tie and pulled his shirt open, but he'd already passed on. Yeah, it must have been a terrible thing for both of you. Yes, sir, it was. Mr. Parker seems to have been a very generous man, especially with his daughter. Oh, he always give her anything she wanted. Bought her another new car just last month. Yeah, I saw it in the driveway. Well, this is a very attractive house. Must be worth twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. Mr. Parker bought it just two years ago. He thought with Miss Lou Ann growing up, she ought to have a better place to live. What's your salary here, Mary? Ninety-five a month, sir. And my keep, of course. Hmm. I wonder how he did it. Sir? Well, Dan Parker made $5,000 a year as county attorney. There's less than 600 in his bank account. The manager said it's never been much higher. And yet, this house, new cars, those clothes of Miss Parker's that you showed me, a $50,000 life insurance policy. How about that, Mary? I don't know nothing about it, sir. And still, with all this, they were always quarreling. How'd you find that out? Why, Mary? What did they quarrel about? Well, it, it's only been the last six months, and it wasn't her fault. It wasn't like her. It was that Sammy that put those ideas in her head. Sammy Drake, the fellow who owns the Happy Hollow? And she was a restless one with nothing to do, and he took advantage of it. Filled a head full of crazy notions. I know it was him. What crazy notions, Mary? Oh, going off to New York, getting on the stage, or dancing in some nightclub. It's the only thing Mr. Parker ever refused her. But he sure put his foot down on that. He said the only way she'd do it would be over... over his dead body. Oh, sir. Thanks, Mary. You've been a lot of help. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the net tightens. A rat runs for cover. Then the whole thing blows wide open. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> <laughs>